It is great to see everyone again this evening. This evening I want to talk a little bit about Jesus Christ and how he dealt with the religious leaders of his day. And I think it's important that we see this and what he did it or what he did and how he did it so that when we have to confront false teachers today, we can have a better way to be able to confront them. Now Paul, of course, he instructs us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're commanded to have the mind that characterized our Lord. We need to have the same attitude, the same spirit, the same disposition. Our Lord lived as a servant, and therefore we too are to live as servants. Our Lord was characterized by humility, and we are to be characterized by the same. He was obedient to the Father. We too need to be obedient to our God. Jesus Christ had a certain attitude towards civil powers. We need to have the same attitude that he did toward the government. And likewise, his attitude that he had toward his earthly parents is to be the same attitude that we have toward our earthly parents. And then, of course, the attitude that Jesus had toward false teachers should characterize the attitude that we have toward the same. Our Lord is presented in the scriptures as the Lamb of God. If you remember when John the baptizer saw Jesus, he said in John chapter 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If you remember when the Ethiopian eunuch was traveling back from Jerusalem after having been there to worship, and he's reading the scriptures, and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he read something about the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is what it said. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. When you think about a lamb, you think of a meek and quiet spirit. But something else about Jesus Christ, he was not just depicted as a lamb, but also as a lion. Listen to the words of John. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, John said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Jesus Christ is described in two different ways in the scriptures. As the Lamb of God, and is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The spirit of the lamb, of course, we know is quite different from that of the lion. And I think the basic lesson is this, is that when men attacked the Lord personally, he did not seek vengeance, and he did not try to retaliate. In fact, Peter said in our scripture reading a little while ago, he said, he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. The Lord, when he was questioned and accused by the chief priest and the elders, it says in Matthew 27, verse 12, that he answered nothing. And in the next two verses, Pilate, when they asked him, he says, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And it says, He answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. But when an attack was made upon his teaching, things were quite different. Jesus took this as a direct attack upon his Father in heaven. And he fought back, and he fought hard. Jesus stood like a rock. He answered, he refuted, and he condemned. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, we see the lion in action as he speaks to the religious leaders of his day, the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, beginning in verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. 
Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. This is the way Jesus spoke to these religious leaders of his day. And they deserved every scathing rebuke. So let's notice some other specific examples how Jesus dealt with the religious leaders of his day. And remember, this is the way that we need to consider how we have to confront the, the false religious leaders of our day. And they are out there. Remember the Apostle John said in 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the world. So yes, we have our work cut out for us. Now to begin our lesson, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to begin in verses 1 through 8. Here Matthew records Jesus and his disciples are going through the grain fields on a Sabbath day. His disciples were hungry. They began to pluck the grain, rub it in their hands to remove the husk, and they began to eat. Well, the Pharisees, they're always on watch concerning Jesus Christ, trying to catch him in something. And they saw this, and they objected to it, and they complained to the Lord. And they said in verse 2 of Matthew 12, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now remember this, the fact that the Pharisees said it did not always make it so. But their position was very clear. They said that by plucking the grain on the Sabbath day that they had violated the law of the Sabbath. Well, in response to this, Jesus said in verses 3 and 4, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? By divine law, the priests were the only ones who could eat of that showbread. But David went and entered into the house of God. He ate the showbread and took some of the bread for his men also. David was not a priest, and therefore he sinned when he ate of that bread. And he was condemned by God for it. Now, David apparently thought that because of the circumstances... Because they were hungry and this food was handy, it was available, that it would justify his actions. And this is pretty much the same thing that the Pharisees thought. The Pharisees never condemned David for that very act, which is a violation of God's will. And yet, they were willing to condemn the Lord's disciples for eating grain on the Sabbath day, which was not a violation of that law. Further, Jesus said in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? That is, the priests on the Sabbath day necessarily perform their duties. They render their prescribed services without violation to the Sabbath law. And therefore, the Sabbath law was not put there to prevent all labor on the Sabbath. Nor did it prevent from one doing good on the Sabbath day. So a big part of the problem simply besides prejudice was pharisaical ignorance. They thought they knew the Sabbath law, but they really didn't. They thought that, for, that uh, plucking and eating grain on the Sabbath day would violate it, but it didn't because the law, the law did not forbid that. And notice that the Lord implied that the disciples were actually blameless. And then the Lord said in verse 6, <clears throat> But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Now, first of all, Jesus is telling the Pharisees that you justify eating the showbread, but you condemn the eating of the grain. Secondly, you justify David, but you condemn one who is greater than David. And third, you justify the desecration of the temple, but you condemn one who is greater than the temple. And then notice what Jesus said in verses 7 and 8. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. God wanted sacrifice. In fact, he commanded sacrifice. 
but he was not going to accept these sacrifices that were offered with the wrong attitude. Jesus seemed to be saying that the Sabbath law was never intended to prevent the extending of mercy or the acceptance of mercy. Whoever made the grain possible for these disciples was extending mercy to them. And, of course, disciples, they were very grateful for the mercy of God because of this. And this was something that the Pharisees really didn't know anything about. They did not understand the mercy of God. The Son of Man, on the other hand, he was full of mercy. He was the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, he himself made the Sabbath, and he is the one who gave the Sabbath law. So he certainly knew what he was talking about, and the Pharisees did not. So the Lord completely refuted the Pharisees' charge. He made it evident that they were inconsistent in what they were saying. They justified David, who had violated the law, but here they come around and they condemn his disciples who did not violate the law. They had read what the law had said, but either they read incorrectly or they understood incorrectly. And they failed to understand the greatness of the one who actually stood before them, the one who was greater than the temple, the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath. And they also failed to understand the meaning of mercy. We have to understand that any doctrine or any teaching that is inconsistent or contradictory, it is a false teaching because truth does not contradict itself. The doctrine of the Pharisees was a false doctrine and Jesus dealt sufficiently with them. He did not back down, but what he did is he refuted them. Let's drop down a few verses here in Matthew chapter 12 to verse 22. Here's an illustration of how the Lord dealt with those who opposed his teaching. Let's notice verses 22 through 28. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Jesus right here is using superb logic, and he skillfully refuted the quibbles of the Pharisees. Now, what the Lord did here is he began with a fact. A fact is a point where there is agreement and something that cannot be refuted. The Pharisees acknowledged one fact, that he did cast out a demon, but what they said is that he did it by the power of the devil. Now, what Jesus did is, is he took this agreed-upon point, this fact, and he proved to them that the kingdom of God was come unto them. He again showed the, cons the inconsistency of the Pharisees' thinking and their doctrine. And I want you to notice the argumentation of the Lord here. The demon had been cast out. That's a fact. Now, it had either been cast out by the power of God or by the power of Satan. The demons being cast out by the power of God would imply that the kingdom of God was come unto them. The casting out of the demon by the power of Satan would imply that Satan's house is divided. And it would also imply that their sons who were casting out demons were doing it by the same power. Now, of course, the Pharisees would never agree that Satan's house was divided or that their sons were casting out demons by the power of Satan. And so it was a false accusation against Jesus Christ to assume that he was doing this by the power of Satan. Rather, it was necessary to realize that Jesus is actually casting these demons out by the power of God, and because of that, in that case, the kingdom of God was come unto them, and they needed to heed that very thought. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. I want to look at one other case here, found in verses 23 through 27. 
Matthew 21, verses 23 through 27. And this is either a Monday or a Tuesday on the, in the week just before the crucifixion. The Lord had entered into the temple, and he was doing his usual teaching. The chief priests and the elders, they came to him. Now remember, when he came into the temple, he had cast out all the money changers and overturned their tables and drove them out with a whip. But the chief priests and the elders, they come to him and they say, verse 23, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? So they're going to ask two things of Jesus Christ. By what authority did you cast these money changers out and allow yourself to be called the son of man and to be able to come and to teach the people? And the second thing is, where did you get this authority to do all of this? Now, of course, remember the Jews here are trying to catch Jesus in a dilemma. A dilemma is a situation involving a choice between two equally unsatisfactory alternatives. And they thought that if he shall say that no one gave him this authority, then his works and his teachings were going to be undermined because they would not be authoritative. And they said, if he should say that God gave him that authority, then they were going to accuse him of blasphemy. They thought they had him in a dilemma. Now remember that these so-called religious Jews, these religious leaders, they were not trying to be honest and they were not trying to be sincere. And Jesus knew that. Now, he was not under any obligation to answer their question knowing that they were trying to entrap him. So the Lord chose to force them to do a little bit of thinking on their own. And if they wanted a dilemma, he was going to give them one. In verses 24 and 25, the Lord said, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Jesus here exhausts the possibilities. Here was a fact concerning the baptism of John. It was either from heaven or it was of men. It was either divine or it was human. It was one or the other and there was no in-betweens here. <clears throat> now this dilemma set the chief priests and the elders to reasoning among themselves and they said in verses 25 and 26, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people for all who John is a prophet. <clears throat> now the problem is, if they say that John's baptism is from heaven, then why didn't they believe what he said and what he said about Jesus Christ? You know, what he taught and then what John said also about Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't they believe that? If they said that his teaching was from men, they feared that they might even be stoned because everyone held John as a prophet of God. So they realized that it was smart not to even answer Jesus. And they said, we cannot tell. The very fact that they were opposing the Lord showed that they actually rejected the work and the teaching of John the baptizer, since Jesus and John were both in total agreement with one another. And John, uh, Jesus unmercifully exposed their dishonesty and their hypocrisy. Jesus then said, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. And then we notice in the following verses that Jesus presents three parables. You have the parable of the two sons, the parable of the wicked husbandman, and the parable of the marriage feast of the king's son. And all of these were intended to expose these Jewish leaders. In fact, it did that very thing. In verse 45 it says, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. The Lord knew how to deal with the questions and the quibbles of men according to their attitudes. He knew that under certain circumstances and times that he was not obligated to answer the questions of his opponents. He also saw the value in answering a question with a question. And he knew the value of forcing men to do a little bit of thinking for themselves, hoping that they would recognize their own erroneous condition. 
And sometimes you just have to put something out there to make them think. Our Lord is our example, and we must seek to have his mind, his attitude, his disposition, his conduct. Our Lord is a lamb, but he's also a lion. He was characterized by love, and because of his love for the truth and for the Father, it compelled him to stand firmly for the truth and to expose all error. The idea that love compels us to do anything, say anything, believe anything just to get along is not found anywhere in the scriptures. And you can't find it anywhere in the teachings, the life, or the work of Jesus Christ. May we always be impressed with the fact that if we want to be Christ-like, we must always uphold that which is right. We must always condemn that which is wrong to let the right shine through. And we need to do so both in word and in our actions. Remember, it is the truth that sets man free, John chapter 8, verse 32. And I know sometimes, many times, we in the Church of Christ, we're accused of being unloving because we stand for the truth and we will not budge from it. But friends, let me tell you, if you let somebody leave believing a lie and they die believing that lie, they're going to be condemned forever, and that is not love. If we don't tell them, show them the way of salvation and tell them the truth that can set them free, we're not showing love to them at all. And it certainly goes for those who are spewing their false doctrines. We need to tell them the truth and show them the truth and refute their error. Maybe you are here this evening, and maybe you have heard some lies. Maybe you have not understood the truth completely. The truth is that Jesus Christ demands that we believe who he is, that he truly is the Son of God. He commands that we repent of our sins, that we confess him before men with our mouths, <clears throat> and that we be baptized for the remission of our sins. And then we live a faithful life unto death. And if you haven't done these things, then we encourage you maybe to study a little further with us. We would love to open up the scriptures and study with you and to see what Jesus truly says, what the truth says about our salvation. If there's something that we can help you with this evening, whatever it may be, we encourage you to respond to the invitation while together we stand and sing.